they went into the Hôtel de Ville and found Robespierre in a room near the session chamber. He was lying on the ground, a pistol shot through his jaw. They picked him up and some of the sans-culottes carried him by his feet and his head. There were at least a dozen round him. They tore off his right sleeve and the back of his blue coat. Meanwhile, a gendarme found Couton and fired a pistol into his body. They searched for the rest of the conspirators. Robespierre was taken to the Committee of Public Safety, still carried by the same man in the same way. He hid his face with his right arm. The procession paused briefly at the foot of the main stairs. Inquisitive people joined the crowd. Several of the nearest lifted his arm to look at his face. One said, he isn't dead, he's still warm. Another, isn't that a fine king? They then laid his head on a box full of mouldy ration bread. He did not move, but he was breathing heavily and put his right hand on his forehead. Clearly, he was trying to hide his disfigured face. Sometimes his forehead contracted and he frowned. Although Robespierre seemed half conscious, his wounds were clearly causing him great pain. Among those who brought him in, there were a gunner and a fireman who never stopped talking to him. They made jokes constantly. One would say, Sire, your majesty is in pain. And the other, well, I think you have lost your tongue. You haven't finished your proposal, and it began so well. Ah, the truth is, you utterly deceived me, you scoundrel. Another citizen said, I only know of one man who understood the art of tyranny, and that is you, Robespierre. Soon afterwards, Elie Lacoste of the Committee of General Security arrived. They showed him the prisoners, and he said they must be taken to the conciergerie. They are outlaws. They were removed. Next, he spoke to a surgeon and told him to dress Robespierre's wounds and make him fit for punishment. The surgeon said that the lower jaw was broken. He put several wads of linen into his mouth to soak up the blood which filled it. Several times, he passed the probe through the hole the ball had made, bringing it out through the mouth. Then, he washed his face and put a piece of lint on the wound. On this, he placed a bandage, which went round the chin. Then, he bandaged the upper part of his head. During this operation, everyone offered their comments. When they put the bandage round his head, a man said, Now they are crowning his majesty. He must have heard all this, for he still had some strength and often opened his eyes. When the wound was dressed, they laid him down again, taking care to put the box under his head as a pillow, until they said, it was time for him to put his head through the little window of the guillotine. At 
at half past four, the carts appeared on the quay. No crowd ever equaled that which was assembled to see the last of Robespierre. The drama was taking place around us executioners rather than with them, in the streets rather than in the carts. Maximilien Robespierre, seated on some straw which one of the assistants had provided for him, was leaning against the side of the cart in which he was. His face was swollen and livid. The fiercest cries, the most vehement exclamations, left him undisturbed. He kept his eyes closed during the whole of the journey. His younger brother, who had attempted suicide by jumping out of a window, was almost insensible. Couton appeared astonished at the rage of the multitude, and in his eyes, which were very soft and intelligent, the utmost surprise could be read. When the carts reached the house of the Duple family, where Robespierre used to live, the drivers were obliged to stop. Rings were formed around the carts, and the people danced madly and furiously. A child brought a pail of blood from a neighbouring butcher's, and the door and walls of Robespierre's abode were smeared with it. The gendarme joined the people. This disgusting manifestation of feeling on the part of the agents of authority had always been allowed since the Queen's execution, and there was no help for it. Robespierre opened his eyes and closed them again when the cart came to a standstill, but this supreme insult by the gendarme left him as unmoved as before. It was a quarter past six o'clock when the cortege at last reached the Place de la Révolution. The convicts were removed from the carts. Gobu, ex-substitute of the public prosecutor and member of the commune, was the first who suffered. Maximilien Robespierre stood leaning against one of the carts, his back turned to the scaffold. His brother was held up by two gendarmes, his wounds not allowing him to stand without support. Couton was in a chair specially provided for him. When Saint Just's turn came, he embraced the cripple, and in passing before the Robespierres, he pronounced the only word of Adieu. His voice betrayed no emotion. Robespierre the Elder nodded in answer, turned round, and looked on while his friend was being strapped to the way plank. He went up the steps of the scaffold without any assistance whatever. His demeanour exhibited neither weakness nor assumed bravery. His eye was cold and calm. I told one of my men 
to take off the linen in which the prisoner's face was wrapped. The man did as he was directed and uncovered the broken jaw. The pain must have been horrible for Robespierre uttered a fearful cry. The blood trickled down from the jaw and the mouth remained wide open. He was immediately strapped down and less than a minute after the knife fell. The head was then shown to the crowd, just like the king's.